I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. I have five kids. They are ages 19 to 28. I homeschooled them for 17 years, and I've been working in the homeschooling community for 25 years. Longer if you count all that time that I was doing my own research as a mom just like you. Today, I like to give webinars live through Periscope, Periscope through Facebook that encourage parents and help them become more effective writing coaches and home educators. If you are on Facebook Live on your phone, next to the comments area, you will see a thumbs up, a heart, a smiley face. You can tap those and they will you know, sort of flutter by on the screen and let me know that you are enjoying this broadcast. It only works if you have recently updated your Facebook app. I'm very glad that you're all finding me. There you all are. I feel so much better now. So today's webinar is called Parallel Play. Parallel Play. And the goal of this session is to talk to you about the role of play in the life of your children. Now, many of us think that play is limited to small children, whether it's our babies, toddlers, preschoolers, or even elementary school kids. And then we kind of get all serious in high school as though play is less relevant. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. In fact, researchers say that all of us benefit from an experience of play throughout our lives. If any of you have started a blog or have taken up running or kayaking, there is a spirit of play that participates in that new exploration. That's what catalyzes your excitement and your enthusiasm. I was just sharing that this morning, I met an 80-year-old man at the mall. We were both drinking our cafe au lait, sitting on a couch, and he was eager to meet me. So we started chatting, and I found out that 20 years ago when he retired, he took up gardening. He ended up taking a master gardening class and became a master gardener. In fact, he just published a book called Plants Are Awesome <laughs> as a fruit of all this gardening enthusiasm. His home has become such a beautiful haven of gardening, he lets anyone in the whole city come to his house to walk the grounds, to sit at his outdoor tables, to read his humorous signs that he's placed all over his backyard. And of course, he invited me, so I'm looking forward to going. But it occurred to me as I was preparing this talk on parallel play, that even in his 60s and 70s, he had seen the value of play as a way to learn the very next thing that he was excited about. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Yes, it was like hide-and-seek finding me today. A little playful, if I might say so. So before we get started on what does play look like at all these different ages, I want to talk to you about our goal as home educators. If you've chosen to stay home and you've decided that you want to be the sole guardian of your children's education, that is an enormous commitment. And most of us make that commitment with the hope that we will accomplish a few specific goals. I want to see if any of these goals are the ones that you had in mind. I wanted to raise wise adults. How about you? I want them to care about their health and fitness. I want them to find a vocation they love. I hope they'll have community involvement. Maybe they'll have an alert and vital mind like this man I met this morning. I hope that they will develop meaningful relationships with other people, not live in isolation. I want them to have a bright sense of humor. I hope they're in touch with their creativity. And most of all, I want them to find a vocation they love, something they're passionate about, right? You know, you can screenshot these and they will act like a little self-made PowerPoint later to remind you of what we talked about. So feel free to do that. In other words, on this list, I didn't put college educated because I didn't know if all my kids would go to college. I didn't put 
passes the SAT with a really high score or masters calculus because we don't know what our kids will be good at. We don't know what they want to do with their lives, but we can talk about the kind of mind that we hope they have. We can talk about the kind of human being we hope they become. So that's what we're talking about here. The goal is wise adults. That's our goal. And wisdom, as we know, is knowledge applied to skill. It doesn't just live in the mind. It actually has to be practiced in the life. One of the um, key sort of brain researchers from the last century, at the end of the 20th century, was Howard Gardner. He is the founder of Project Zero at Harvard. And one of the things he identified is that there are several intelligences in each of us. You may have already heard of these, but we're gonna go over them because I think the reinforcement's important. Sometimes we associate intelligence with the ability to memorize information, or get high scores on tests, or to do well in math. You know, famously my dad said to me, true intelligence is revealed in mathematical genius. Of course, I was a writer and not great at math, so I suddenly felt like I wasn't as smart. And that is a little bit the effect that school can have on us. We can feel like if I'm not a good, a good student who can perform the way school expects, I must not be intelligent. But that is not what Howard Gardner says. Howard Gardner says that there are eight intelligences, and here they are. The first one is visual spatial. A lot of your kids who are artists, or you as adults who are artists, have that intelligence. Another one is verbal, the ability to self-express in language. Another one is musicality, the ability to play an instrument or to listen to music and understand it at a deeper level than just pleasure. Another one is logic and math, of course. That is a huge intelligence that we all already esteem. But how about this one, kinesthetic? You think Stefan Curry isn't kinesthetically intelligent? I think he is. Interpersonal, this would be the intelligence of networking and relationships, a therapist, somebody who is really good at maximizing their interpersonal communication. The seventh one is self-awareness, also called intrapersonal. Self-awareness, the ability to know what's going on with you and to make changes. And then the last one is naturalistic, that would be the kind of skill that a birder would have or someone who's very oriented to the outdoors or who's interested in observation and making calculations and determinations based on their observation skills. These eight intelligences then make up the human community. And when we only value the student kinds of intelligences, we sometimes overlook those that are specific to our children. However, if we make use of the intelligences we see showing themselves in our children, sometimes we get all the rest thrown in for the bargain. We can see them grow in math when we're able to relate it to music or to their bodies in a way that we don't get there if we only use verbal. Understood? So that is the first piece. So let's just start for those joining me now. Parallel Play is the name of this talk, and it's all about how parents and children can use play to enhance their growth into educated adults. The goal is not just to get kids ready for school during the preschool years, but to use play as a vital part of the educational equipment all the way through high school. And our goal is to raise wise adults in all these arenas and to maximize the eight areas of intelligence. All right? So let's look at the kind of play that grows intelligence, grows those eight intelligences. All right? Ready? Here you go. <laughs> My artwork's a little bit, uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit cluttered, but if you take a screenshot, you can look at this in more detail later. Play that grows intelligences. So sports 
is incredibly important for children. It helps them discover their bodies and to discover strategy, interpersonal dynamics, self-awareness. Almost all eight are going to be represented in sports, but we rarely think of it that way. How about in the creative arts? Giving our children the opportunity to explore the visual and the metaphorical, gameplay, nature observation, writing down those things that we're learning, dance, uh, what's this one? Conversation, so important. Being able to express yourself not just in a monologue, but being able to listen to feedback from someone else and then contribute another meaningful piece to that growing discussion. And of course, music. All of this contributes to our understanding of our own intelligences. But not only that, they contribute to sort of a healthy growth of all eight intelligences. And we want our kids to have well-rounded experiences. We don't just say, my kid's kinesthetic so she can never learn anything cerebral. No, we're thinking more along the lines of how can that kinesthetic person learn the cerebral using the body? And that brings me to what I consider the key to this talk. So I hope you're listening. When we're talking about development of the mind, we're talking about cognitive development, cognition, how the brain processes information and makes it the learner's own possession, right? So what's firing in the mind and how is the child or the adult making that information their own possession? Well, there are lots of ways to access that cognitive piece in human beings. I want to introduce you to a concept called distributed cognition. I'm going to show you the card in a second. Distributed cognition. We all think of cognition in the mind, but distributed cognition is intelligence located in the body. Intelligence located in the body. What do I mean by that? There is an intelligence that is a felt sense. It isn't simply the intelligence of recall or applying formulas to math problems or learning to read and decode. It is a felt sense in the body. Have you ever experienced needing to retrace your steps back to where you had a thought to remember what that thought is, that's distributed cognition. That is you using the senses of your body to call to mind information that had been attached to the powers of your observation and experience. So when you were in the laundry room having the thought, and then you come up the stairs from the basement, and you get to the kitchen and you think, oh my gosh, I can't remember what it was I was going to do. What do you do? You retrace your steps, you go back down the stairs, and you stand in that laundry room until the thought returns. Why? Why couldn't you recall it in the kitchen in the same way you can recall it in the basement? because your body created an association with the thought. It used your eyes, your, the sounds, and the feeling in your body. In fact, one of the bits of research that I learned about in the last month is that if you study in the same room where you take a test, you will have far greater recall for that test than if you study like in the library and then have to go to the classroom. And so some students try to study in the actual classrooms in college so that when they get there for the testing day, all that data will be recalled by the lighting, the shape of the chair, the feel of the space. Isn't that fascinating? Distributed cognition felt sense, body as part of learning. Well, what does a better job of involving the body in learning than play? Not much else. It's one of the reasons that music, art,
theater, and sports are so popular for children because the kind of learning that happens when you are involved in these activities is multidimensional. It's using your hands, your taste, your sight, your body feel, interpersonal, kinesthetic, visual, verbal. It's like you know, a mishmash of all eight intelligences happening at once, creating this meaningful outcome. Is it any wonder then that our kids are so excited to participate in the school play and not that interested in studying grammar? But what if grammar could rise to the level of play, of multi-sourced input to create that kind of gestalt? Do you know what I mean? How are we doing? Does this make sense so far? I'm going to read some comments now. Oh, we have some amazement. Nice. I like amazement. <laughs> yes, Kim says, no wonder I felt like I studied for eight hours and could never recall. Absolutely. There is a kind of learning that is different when you involve the body. Okay. But what actually activates the body? Do we just tell our kids to memorize formulas marching up and down the stairs in the living room or tell them to do jumping jacks while they're writing a paper? No, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about creating a social context for learning. That's what play is. It is a social context for learning. Got it? Oh, Betsy, we'll talk about grammar. You hang in there. I'm coming to it. There's lots of ways. In fact, just a quick PSA, the Homeschool Alliance this month is focused on how to teach punctuation using the body. Hmm, the body and the voice. So if you want a practical application right away, join the Homeschool Alliance, which can be found at CoachJulieBogart.com. But let me keep going. Social context is what creates the spirit of play. Can you play by yourself? Absolutely. We all remember building little blocks in our bedrooms or cuddling our dolls or dressing up by ourselves. But play, by and large, is a participatory experience with more than one person. We have this notion in the homeschool world, perhaps built from school, I'm not sure, but there's this idea that the holy grail of learning is independence. Like you should be able to hand your child, let me grab a book, um, a book, and then they sit down and read it, and you can be off in a different room, you know, doing some other task, and they are independently marching through the material and performing at the right level without any help from you. How many of you feel like, oh, that's what I think home education is. That's the goal, for them to sit at the table, do the lesson, and not rely on me so much. Does anyone have that feeling? We'll see. <laughs> the comments lag behind on Facebook Live. It's not as quick as Periscope. Um, yeah, it is a huge myth, Rebecca. You are absolutely right. When you get into the workplace, how often are you just shut up in a room all by yourself and told to work independently? Don't you have some accountability, staff meetings, people who supervise and look at the work you produce? Uh, the opportunity for a collaborative environment is the current workforce environment everywhere. Even in my company, where people live all over the country who work for Brave Rider, we collaborate. We have a, a meeting on Monday mornings where we look at each other's faces over our computer screens to discuss what we're doing. People overvalue independence and they shame interdependence. And yet the primary skill we all need as adults is the ability to sustain and nourish interdependent relationships. Marriage is built on it. Parenting is built on it. You know, local community groups, charitable organizations, even your local homeschool co-op. So, someone says, when you have multiple kids, you desire this, but as I've tried it, it only works with one of my kids and only since he hit 14. That's Chantel who shared that. There is space for independent work, but I think that's different than independent learning. And let me make that distinction now. Independent work is taking an academic risk 
or reinforcing what you already know because you don't need the support or the stimulation of a partner. But independent learning to me is a myth because to learn also means that you are being introduced to a skill or to um, an activity that is not yet within your mastery. So when you are taking an academic or learning risk, you benefit from a partner. Think back to when you were teaching your kids to ride a bicycle. You didn't just stick them on a two-wheeler and put them out on the street to learn to be independent cyclists. And you weren't afraid that if you ran alongside and supported them, they'd never learn how to ride by themselves. You give the appropriate amount of support to the level of skill, and then as those shift, your support can go away and the independence can grow. And that's how it works. So you are like training wheels for your kids half the time. And then when you start to see them take off, you can inquire and ask questions like, are you ready to try this on your own? Okay, so let's keep going. What does play give us then in the learning experience that we can't get by just doing a workbook or mastering a bunch of facts or drilling or testing or quizzing? Why do we want to use play in the academic task? Here's why. The four F's. Play enables freedom, flexibility, fascination, and fun. I'm not even a big fan of the word fun because sometimes fun sounds coercive, but you know, it's one of the F's. So freedom, flexibility, fascination, and fun. Positive challenges in a safe environment. That's what play is about. So think about testing and quizzing for a minute. Which of these do tests support? None. I would not say a test feels like freedom, flexibility, fascination, or fun. I would also consider testing not a safe environment. I wouldn't even necessarily consider it a positive challenge. Now, there are some tests that kids enjoy taking that are all those things. For example, how many of you like to do Facebook quizzes, you know, to find out what personality you have or which, you know, ancient literary novel is the most like your personality or the one that you like the best, right? Or which character are you most like in Fringe, in, in the Friends series? Those are the kinds of tests that encourage freedom, flexibility, fascination, and fun. But when we're talking about traditional testing, the kind you find in school, not a safe environment, not even always a positive challenge. Now, I'm not gonna argue about whether or not there is a space for testing. All kids who go to college are gonna take tests, so it's a good skill to learn, and you can even learn it in a playful way at home. We'll talk about that. But here's what we wanna think about in just the typical educational objectives we have. How can we invite freedom, flexibility, fascination, and fun into the traditional subject areas? So someone asked me about grammar. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Grammar is intuitively understood by native speakers. They know more grammar rules simply by being a native speaker than any second language speaker who tries to master that language. And they know them all by age five. So if we're going to start with grammar instruction, where we're helping our kids put names to their intuitive felt sense of grammar, shouldn't we start with the idea that they're brilliant? Instead of starting with the concept that our children don't know grammar and it's hard and tedious and they don't like it and it never sticks, couldn't we start by talking about how well they understand their own language? Maybe we ask a question and I'm about to share with you a practice that Dr. Peter Elbo shared with me, who is a writing guru in my life and has written countless books on writing. What he shared with me was this, he said, what if we asked our kids to describe a person or a thing? Like perhaps they were going to describe this teacup. So they might say something like, the teacup is small, blue and white, 
and fragile. Okay? So now we're looking at the teacup and we're thinking, well, could we say it was fragile, blue and white, and small? Usually when we line up adjectives, we have a word order that we associate, but we never think about. We usually start with the size. We don't usually save that for the end. So we can actually help our children recognize that they already understand something about grammar simply by inductively playing with the language they use every day. One of the games we play in our Groovy Grammar Workshop, for example, is we have kids collect words from everywhere they see them, in magazines, on billboards, online, uh, written in the church program, out of the books of Harry Potter, and they write down these single words that are interesting to them, to them on little word tickets. And then they take those tickets and they start laying them on a table and sorting them into groups. They get to decide what groups they're in. Maybe all the words that start with the letter B go in one group. Maybe all the words that have the color green associated with them go in another group. Maybe another group is words that are three letters long. These are all ways to categorize language. And even though those aren't our traditional grammar categories, asking your children to assign rules to language is the practice of a grammarian. And each of those categories has value within a grammar context. So if we start with a playful relationship to language and we do it in conversation and we get it out of the brain and into a kinesthetic practice, we are actually catalyzing the cognition that creates learning. So different than reading a list of rules, handing a child a set of sentences, and then expecting them to perform it correctly or they get some wrong. Curiosity, creativity, exploration, fascination, flexibility, fun. That's what we're looking for when we talk about play. Now, one of the ways to think about this partnership is kind of a word phrase that's very academic. So I decorated it a little bit, <laughs> and then we'll talk about what it is, okay? I want you to think about what they call the zone of proximal development. ZPD, zone of proximal development. What does that mean? It means this, doing it together. <laughs> You're going to look for your child's next level of challenge, the adjacent challenge, where they are today. What's the next incremental step they could take? And how can you partner with them in taking the risk to get there? So think about cognitively what your child is needing next in whatever arena. And then you're going to only challenge them just far enough that they can grow meaningfully and you're going to support them while they do it. If we think that way rather than grade level, we will be more in tune with our children's natural stages of development. However, if we think grade level, we are much more likely to be panicked when they get behind or to feel like they are somehow um, missing in interesting or important content that kids their age already know. But all that does is put pressure on the learning experience and ultimately breaks down the relationship. And we don't want that. So think of the zone of proximal development, that next stage of growth that they need in order to be successful. I wanted to read you something about that. All right, so Lev Vygotsky from 1978 calls this the zone of proximal development and notes the critical importance of scaffolding. That is making sure the young person has developed the skills and abilities to achieve his goals. Parents who have come to know their child well are in the best position to make sure these skills are in place throughout the child's development and to help adolescents take on more mature responsibilities, learn new age-appropriate skills, and meet new challenges. So remember how I said this is not just for small children. You do this naturally with your adolescents 
when you teach them to drive. Do you just put them in the front seat of a car and get on the freeway? Of course not. You go to an empty parking lot where no human beings are present and you put your child in the driver's seat and you are right next door in the passenger seat and the first thing you do is just learn how to turn on the ignition and put on a seat belt and then you inch forward and then you stop and you experience putting it in and out of gear and then when you start going you make sure there's a lot of space for turning so that they don't have to make any sharp turns when they're first learning correct and any time that your child is overwhelmed or makes a mistake or needs a break you get in the driver's seat and put them in the passenger seat. You do this so naturally when you're teaching them to drive or you're teaching your child how to walk. You don't just take this little baby who's been crawling, stand her on her feet and tell her to go. You let her balance using all of the coffee tables in the house and holding onto your pant leg. And eventually she'll let go and she'll walk. But even when she's walking, and able to do it, aren't there times you still put her in the stroller because she's too slow, can't keep up, gets tired? And you don't worry that, uh-oh, that means she's no longer an independent walker. You just know that eventually she's going to get the hang of it and you won't need that stroller anymore. There are all these different incremental spaces that our kids need to go through. And the zone of proximal development is just a catchphrase for recognizing that you don't go from 0 to 60 or 0 to 100 in one step. You get to help them move there. Every time the level of challenge goes up, the need for support must correspond. And as that challenge becomes easier, the support can drop off. Does that make sense? You got it? All right, so let's look at some of these play strategies. Strategies for parallel play. You ready? Here we go. All of these start with S and you might want to take a screenshot so that you can remember them but I'm going to unpack them one by one. First let's do the overview. The first one I call silent side-by-side -side play. Silent side-by-side -side play. I'll show this each time we do a next one, the next one. What do I mean by that? Picture this. You have a brand new baby, and that baby is in bed. And your husband or your wife, if you're the stay-at-home parent, your spouse is off at work teaching in the evening. And you are alone with the one child who is three or four years old. And it is up to you to entertain this child. But you're tired. It's been a long day. You've already made dinner, already given this child a bath, but it isn't time for bed. And all you really want to do is watch TV. <laughs> Let's be real. You want to do some decompressing experience. But you have this child who needs to be entertained. What if you pulled out coloring books? One for you. Here it is again. One for you and one for your child. And now you pull out magic markers or prismacolor coloring pencils or crayons and side by side without even talking maybe with a movie on in front of you or music on in the background you're both coloring in your own coloring books parallel play you're both valuing the same task but you aren't doing it with each other I'm not coloring his picture and he's coloring his picture we each have our own picture we're each coloring, but we're doing it side by side. There's no direction. There's no instruction. There's nobody turning this into a lesson on how to color. These are two individuals, a four-year-old and a mother in her 30s, playing, coloring. What would this look like with a 12-year-old? Well, perhaps it's a cold winter's night and there's nothing good on TV and so you light a fire in the fireplace and everybody gets a book to read and they're all reading their own book and you're sitting in the living room together and it's just reading time people reading to themselves in the company of one another another example what if you take all of your kids to the park some are on the swings some are on the slides 
and you've got on your running shoes and you just run in circles <laughs> around the playground to get some exercise while you're super supervising. This is what it is. Parallel play, silent side by side means you're not being an instructor. You are simply living the experience of whatever it is everyone's doing in the company of one another. Why is this powerful? Because we overvalue the communication. We overvalue the instruction and the teaching and we forget what did we learn early on in this talk? I'm gonna go find it. We forget distributed cognition, intelligence located in the body. If we are playing, if we are side by side, we create an opportunity for the context to give space for learning. Robin shares that they've been doing that with gardening. Absolutely. I recommend this, for example, with copywork. I think it's important if your children are copying a passage from a book that they value, that you as the homeschool parent also copy a passage from a book that you value. What does that teach your family? It teaches your family that copy work is valuable. It also creates a context where it's normative to do copy work. It also invites future conversation that you don't even know is going to happen until you've shared this experience a number of times. Because eventually someone is going to say, hey, I want you to see the passage I picked. Or, mom, I want you to look at how I doodled around the edges of my copy work. Does that make sense? Yes, Jean is explaining that they've always done that with free writing. One of my favorite writing instructors is a woman named Patricia Schneider. She has a book called Writing Alone and with Others. She leads writing workshops in the inner city, in college contexts, and for professional writers. One of the things that she says is that you should never assign writing unless you're willing to take the same writing risk as your students. So think about that in the homeschool context. If we are doing free writing, why wouldn't the parent also subject herself to that same experience of risky self-disclosure, just like we expect of our children? How does this change the feel of learning? Well, I invite you to try it and you tell me, but I'm here to tell you from my experience, it's powerful and it's all without having to talk. So how fabulous is that? All right, number two, shared task. So the first one is silent, side by side. The second one is shared task. You can also collaborate around a single task. Somebody's bringing up the antsy toddlers. Oh my goodness, toddlers and babies can really throw a wrench into any of this learning. Just know that it's for a moment and the moment might last a year. You're going to have to steal time. It will have to be after a toddler's in bed or it has to involve the toddler or you've got the toddler on your hip while you're facilitating the opportunity for everyone else to do copy work and maybe at another time you do your own and share it during their copy work time. You might have to make use of video, but these are parenting issues and I'm gonna avoid those today because I've got so much to get through. So the first one was side by side, silent side by side. The second is shared task. So you all do this already and I'm gonna give you an example that you all do. How many of you have kids who wanna make muffins or cookies? Everybody, does everyone wanna make muffins and cookies in their family. So what do you do? You get the step stool, you know, you pull out the bowl. Let's see, I've got a bowl. You get the bowl, you start pulling out all the ingredients and everybody's in. One person is cracking the egg. One person is leveling off the flour. Everybody gets a turn stirring. Someone else sprays the muffin tins with that oil spray. And then we dump it all in, bake it, and it's a shared community project, right? Shared tasks are powerful. We don't have to do everything one grade, one child at a time. That's impossible when you're a mother of multiple children, and I had five. Can you do a writing project that way? 
Well, of course you can. You could do the end of the year newsletter, Christmas letter, whatever you call it, and have every child contribute a piece of writing and put it all together and share it with your family. You could have your whole family watch a movie series that goes with the books and have one person create a poster, one person write a review, one person write a literary analysis essay, and one person write a new ending. And this would be a community project related to one subject area. If you're studying history, why wouldn't the whole family study history of the same subject, the Civil War for the whole family? And people respond to it in their own creative ways. You could throw a party as a group and everybody participates. You've got mom helping to drive places and buy supplies. You've got the kid who knows how to handwrite making the invitations. You've got the child who knows how to use the sewing machine sewing little bags that will hold the treasures at the party. You've got the child who knows how to cook making the food. This is what we're talking about when we say shared task. And the kind of learning that comes is playful. It's awesome. Third one. Separate interests, separate interests. Can you live your interests in front of your child and then value the interests they have that they live in front of you? Let me give you an example. I know for me, I got fascinated with Jane Austen in my 30s. First time I ever read her books, Started watching, you know, Colin Firth, ha, 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 who wouldn't get interested from that show? And the next thing you know, I was reading every one of her books, watching every one of those movies built from those books. And my daughter, Johanna, caught the bug. She loved seeing me watch these movies in the middle of the homeschooling day because I saw no reason to separate them from what we were doing in the daytime. I would just pop the movie in. Everyone would end up watching it or playing with their blocks or their dolls while the movie was on. And suddenly she got interested in vintage dance. Well, I catalyzed that interest just through my own curiosity, but it catalyzed one in her. I could easily have discounted it. We didn't have money for lessons and it didn't seem directly relevant to anything we were doing in school, but I knew that this was a meaningful way for her to relate to the Jane Austen era of literature. Why? Distributed cognition, intelligence located in the body. She didn't want to just read Jane Austen. She wanted to dance. She wanted to go to a ball. She wanted to wear the dress. She wanted to feel like she was living in the 1800s. So you know what we did? We found a vintage dance company here in Cincinnati for adults. They allowed us to bring Johanna and Noah, who at the time were like 11 and 13, and they participated in this adult company. We had no money to pay for it. They told us we could participate for free if we distributed their flyers every Monday in the neighborhood, which we did in the rain, in the snow, with a baby and a toddler. Mostly a toddler. She wasn't that small anymore. She was like three. You get it? That was a way that separate interests collaborated for learning. And that experience led her to writing her own version of a Jane Austen story set in the Civil War period. And it became this wonderful celebration for our whole family to witness and participate in. So don't be afraid to pursue separate tasks. You will notice that there is a dialogue between what you're curious about and what your kids adopt and are curious about. But let me point this out. It should go both ways. So what happens if you have a child who's a big gamer and you don't value that and you don't like it? You know what that means? All the learning going on in the online gaming is invisible to you and you will devalue all the growth, all the cognitive development, and then you will start to resent what's going on that is invisible to you. I remember when Liam was, oh my gosh, he was in his teens for sure, and still living at home, and I was on the computer and our backs were to each other because we were often both on the computer in the same room at the same time. And he said, hey mom, come over here, I wanna show you something. 
and with my back to him, like this, I said, I'm busy right now. What do you want? And he said, Mom, come here. I need you to get this. Well, that caught my attention. So I logged out of what I was doing. I walked over to the computer, sat next to him, and he said, I need you to see and understand this because I am having an exceptional day and I want you to be happy for me. And I was like, oh, tell me more. Well, apparently, Liam's team in the game he was playing was actually being broadcast in Korea at that very moment. And gamers from around the world were watching his team battle it out with another team on a global scale. And I knew nothing about his gaming life. I didn't know he was that good. I didn't know it was that valuable to him. Then he went through screen by screen showing me his statistics and explaining each one so that I got it. It was humbling and humiliating. My son had been cultivating those skills for years and it had not occurred to me to say, hey, show me how good you are at this. On the flip side, he was on the chess team at the local high school, first board by the time he was a senior in high school, I went to all his matches. I asked him to show me how he played chess. I bought him books to improve his chess game. And yet in video gaming, he was so good, he was being watched internationally and I knew nothing about it. Those are what I'm talking about when I say separate interests. Allow your personal interests and your child's to create a learning relationship between you. That's the power of play. So much good going on and we don't value it because it looks like play. All right, number four, silly exploration. Silly exploration. I should say it in a more silly way. Silly exploration. <laughs> what is silly exploration? Well, it's making a mockery of the subject. It's poking holes in it. It's creating a relationship with it where you're the master. It doesn't master you. So how can we do this? We can do this with math, can't we? Can't we just do violence to math? Why don't we just start out with you know, throwing balls into a waste can and counting those as, to, as opposed to counting dots on a page, right? What would happen if we counted jumps, steps, uh, the staircase in our house, how many stars we can see in the night sky, as opposed to all of the little abstract representations on a page in a textbook? What if we were able to engage calculus at a young age because actually calculus is a part of math. It's not the end destination. It's the language of math. I don't know anything about calculus. I'm just telling you what I've been told. <laughs> but I know it's possible. And I tried. I really did. We used family math. We used math games. We did math it to learn the math facts. I wanted a spirit of play around math. I lacked confidence in my own mathematical abilities, which often undermined me. I would run scurrying back to the textbooks, to the workbooks, to the scopes and sequences as my security. And you know what it did? It undermined my ability to see my children really grow in their math skills. So when they got to high school, I finally caught on and we paired them with a tutor who is passionate about the subject and was able to make it come to life for my kids. And all five have turned out to be fantastic at math. Came from a relationship. They had silly exploration. They invested deeply. They had side-by-side -side learning. So if you want a subject to come to life for your kids, you want to provide that level of passion, that level of expertise, that level of enthusiasm when you can. Will you always? Of course not. There are going to be holes, gaps, flaws, weaknesses in your homeschool, just like they would get in school. It's just it'll be a different group. 
And that is life on the planet. <laughs> so make peace with that. But if you give yourself over to the spirit of play, the open door that is created through this relational dynamic when you are exploring the subjects that you value, you will see the kind of growth that you really want that will lead you to this wise adult, the wise adult goal. All right, last one. We've done all the S's. Silent side-by-side -side play. Shared task, separate interests, silly exploration, and finally, support for risks. Support for risks. When your child is ready to tackle some new dimension of any subject that they are attempting to learn, they need you by their side. Doesn't matter how old they are. I love to share the story of my mom and how she helped me as a writer. For those who don't know, my mom is a professional writer. She's written 88 books and they're all published. She has taught professionals how to write for over 40 years. So I was pretty lucky. And when I was growing up, she gave me key moments of writing support that to this day I remember. But the one I wanna share with you now happened in high school. I was getting ready to turn in a research paper, my very first one, written about James Thurber. And the day I needed to type it, which back then was not a computer, so you make one mistake on this page and you gotta start the page over, okay? That's the era I grew up in. I woke up and suddenly realized it was daylight savings. I had already lost a whole hour and I knew it was going to take me the entire day to type this paper. It was 15 pages. You had to measure it to get the footnotes correct at the bottom of the page. Like really a nightmare. And I woke up and burst into tears and I shared this anxiety with my mother and she said, no problem. You sit in that chair. I'll sit at the typewriter. I will type your paper. You read it to me. And she partnershiped with me, partnered with me to get that paper finished. She didn't give me a lecture about budgeting my time. She didn't talk to me about how I should have known better and known how to do this. She didn't worry that she was doing some key piece of the process and somehow I was getting out of it. No, she saw that the research paper had just about bested me. I had given all I knew how to give. And now she was bringing the matching level of support to that project and we got it done and it was fabulous. Someone's asking to see the card again. <clears throat> Support for risks. So that's gonna be yours to sort out with your own family. But when you see someone struggling, that means that they are going up a level in the challenge and you get to be the partner. Now, are there times when your kids are sort of just relying on you and they're not really living up to their own fulfillment of their skill set? Well, of course, we call that in my house immaturity. And teens have a right to their immaturity, just like you do. Do they get to live there, set up camp, stay there for good? No. But some days, immaturity is an appropriate reaction. It's a scurrying back to safety where mom and dad will be in charge. You can cater to that occasionally. Heavens, I want adults to indulge my immaturity from time to time. It feels good. It's like nurturing, like, oh, good, I don't have to be the perfectly adept adult at all moments. Don't some of you hope your spouses will do that for you occasionally, bail you out? But then you can also call them to their higher selves through conversation, through dialogue, through sharing the vision of what it means to be that wise adult. Hey, this is where we're going. This is how I want to help you get there. How can I help you today without taking over? What are you going to bring to the table that will help us get there? Someone asked for an example of silly exploration related to spelling, which I'm thrilled to give. So, what if we put on a whiteboard a whole bunch of misspellings and the original spelling of a word, and we played with those words. We even thought about 
turning a word into a homonym that doesn't exist currently, or we analyzed why we can spell a word in a way that helps us say it so easily, but the correct spelling doesn't look anything like that. And maybe find other words that correlate, that cluster around that same you know, sequence of letters to create that sound, even though they don't really look like they make that sound. Silly exploration is more about being willing to ask questions as opposed to finding answers. That's how I think about it. Uh, and I, I think you can also be playful with all of these. Oh, somebody wants the wise adults. Go ahead and screenshot that. Um, we can be playful with any subject matter. You know, I remember when I read uh, Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder to my kids, and we got to the page where they were describing the big farm breakfast that Almanzo was having in his home. It include, included apple pie and ham for breakfast, in addition to hot cakes and eggs and uh, potatoes and fruit and all of that. And my kids immediately asked, well, can we have a Farmer Boy breakfast? Well, yes, of course we can. That's totally on task for this. I would call that silly exploration. Being willing to try things. Um, when we studied the colonial times, we read about how they used to dye cloth using beets and onions. Guess what we did? We bought some beets and onions and we dyed cloth <laughs> to see what color they would turn. So give yourself permission to take time out of the homeschool day to do things that expand the learning and the feel of play. That's where all your children's homeschool memories are going to come from. In fact, Poetry Tea Time, this little guy right there, is the picture of my whole philosophy. You are taking something you value, poetry, and something your children value, treats, and special table settings, and you're bringing those together to create a third thing, love for poetry and family connection. If you can bring that kind of sort of nourishment and nurturing to the family in all the subjects, you will have a lively, rich homeschool. Can you do it in all six or seven subjects simultaneously every day? What do you think I'm going to say? Of course not. But this isn't school. You don't have to do six or seven subjects in a day. In fact, you can pick one subject and deep dive it for two weeks and avoid everything else if you want to. You get to decide what creates aliveness and learning in your family. We just published this book, Poetry Tea Time Companion, as a way for you to experience public domain poetry with gorgeous artwork and some interesting information about the uh, poet and some questions to ask your kids about the poem um, as a way to bring some of that spirit of play into your family. If you go to blog.bravewriter.com, you will see that you can download a PDF file that talks about parallel play built from all the posts we've used on the blog on that subject. And then on the last page, you will find information about how to buy this book if you would like one for your family. You can also find it on Amazon.com and my name, Julie Bogart, and that will take you to it. Um, is that for all ages? Absolutely. It goes from the smallest, youngest child all the way to adult, and these are all different poems. I'll, I'll read you some of the titles uh, in case you want to know what they are. Um, Introduction to the Songs of Innocence by William Blake. A Hymn to the Morning by Phyllis Wheatley, um, A Dirge in the Woods by George Meredith, The Autumn by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, The Eagle by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, let's see some other fun ones. Have You Got a Brook in Your Little Heart by Emily Dickinson, The Four Elements by Anne Bradstreet, We Have a Little Garden by Beatrix Potter, Evening Star by Edgar Allan Poe. So as you can see, these are just high quality classics that are compiled, 52 poems, one for every week of the year. And um, Jeanette has posted the link for how to get the PDF download. So if you are on Facebook Live right now, just check in the comments and you can go straight there. That is it. So what I'd like to do before we hang up here is review. <laughs> Let's go through all of these again and then we're done. It's already been an hour. 
So today's talk was about parallel play, how to bring play into the homeschool. I use the word parallel because I think of the parent as participating alongside the child. And our first discovery when we think about academic growth is that we want to figure out what is our goal. And our goal is to raise wise adults, adults who care about health and fitness, an alert vital mind, uh, community involvement, a vocation they love, creativity, sense of humor, meaningful relationships, right? And the way that that play enables us is that it helps us discover our native intelligences. And there are eight of those. The Project Zero from the Harvard researcher identified visual, logic and math, verbal, kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, self-awareness, and naturalistic intelligences in humans. And when we engage these, we create learning. The kind of play that grows these intelligences are things we're already doing, but sometimes undervalue and think of more as electives rather than essentials. And here they are. Play that grows intelligences. Creative artwork, nature, sports, gameplay, writing things down, dance, conversation, and musical instruction. What we discovered then is that play brings the four F's, freedom, flexibility, fascination, and fun. Think of your child on a sports team and you'll know immediately that all of these are at work in every practice. And as they gain the skills, then they're ready to participate in games. Positive challenges in a safe environment are what create the opportunity for play. One of the things that we sometimes forget, however, is that learning is not a function of the brain. It is also located in the body, and we called that distributed cognition. Intelligence is located in the body, not just the mind. So if we can involve the body, we actually create the hooks that help learning to take hold. And one of the strategies that we discussed for that development is what we call the Zone of Proximal Development, ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. That is the notion that you will only ask of your child what is the very adjacent next level of challenge, and you will provide adequate support while that child takes on the next level of challenge. So what were some of those strategies for parallel play? Well, first of all, parallel play requires the social context, a parent and a child, or a team, or a group. That really helps the play to take hold. And we do it in these five ways. Silent, side-by-side -side play or learning shared tasks where we're doing the same thing together, separate interests where we each feel free to pursue our own interests in the presence of one another and benefit mutually from those separate interests, silly exploration where we take something that feels big and overwhelming and we're silly with it, we play with it, we do violence to it before we get serious about all of its components. And then finally, we provide support for risks. That's one of the key ways we take advantage of this zone of proximal development. And that, my friends, is what I call parallel play. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was a fantastic audience, so many participants. I will go through and read all the comments once we're done, and I will reply to any questions that you post now or in the future. I always continually go back to these videos to make sure that I have answered questions and given you resources that help you become an effective home educator. If you want to know more about what we do in Brave Writer, 
visit our website, bravewriter.com. We have materials that make use of the spirit of play, as well as hitting those markers you care about. We also have online writing classes that are both for you and for your kids. And if you're looking for more support in your homeschooling tasks specifically, you can join the Homeschool Alliance by going to coachjuliebogart.com. That's where we do all of this discussion with web conferencing, audio lectures, and specially selected readings every month to help you grow in your home education project. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure to download the free PDF file for Parallel Play that Jeanette has posted in the comments. There's a link to that. It's yours for free. I think it's 12 pages long. It has some cute pictures and maybe it will provide you with a little reinforcement as you take those little steps toward freeing up space in the homeschool. Thank you so much for joining me. You would love to know what I think about unschooling and parenting and homeschooling gifted children. Monica, I have talked on those subjects already. So some of that will be found at YouTube, also at my blog, and we will do more of them, of course, because those are hot topics. Thank you again. Great having you today. I hope you have a fantastic week. Bye, everybody. Mwah. Live honestly. Write Bravely, I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer.